Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. And today's discussion with James Kerchick, author of Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and your host for today. You might have noticed I'm not Michelle Miao. She uh, usually, of course, co-hosts this program, but she was not able to make it tonight. So tonight, get settled in and enjoy a one-on-one -on -one conversation here between myself and author James Kerchick. Now, at the Commonwealth Club, we're continuing to produce hundreds of programs on a wide variety of issues, online as well as many in-person programs. So head over to CommonwealthClub.org for many more upcoming programs as well as video and audio of our past events. If you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to uh, send us questions and I'll work some of them into our discussion here today. So James, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you very much for having me. Let's set the table here. So your book, Secret City, it's a large book, and it's about gay history in Washington for much of the 20th century. What was the origin story of this book? How, how and why did you get into uh, this book? And why did you want to tell this story? Well, uh, I've always been interested in American history and particularly Cold War history. And when I was a student at Yale, I was very fortunate to study with a professor named John Lewis Gaddis, who's the Dean of Cold War Studies. Uh, he's also a biographer. He, he wrote uh, uh, George Kennan's biography, The Great Cold War Strategist. And Professor Gaddis was teaching a seminar my junior year at Yale on the art of biography. And every week we would read um, a different biography. And our final project had to be on a figure, living or dead, whose papers are held in the Yale archives. And I chose a man named Larry Kramer. Uh, who was a very famous gay activist and playwright, novelist, and the founder, co-founder of the, or, the AIDS organization ACT UP. Um, and his papers were at Yale, and I used his papers and got to know Larry, interviewed him. And Larry was very interested in gay history and in recovering uh, the stories that had been lost to history. And getting to know Larry and getting to know this sort of passion of his um, after I graduated Yale, I moved to Washington to work at the New Republic magazine. And Larry was always sort of pestering me about, you know, these secret gay stories and wanting to know who who was gay and um, what was really happening behind the scenes in Washington. And so over the course of those several years, I became I came to realize that there was this massive sort of vacuum, uh, this big empty space that hadn't been recorded. Um, and that there were all these gay men and women who, because of the secrecy that they had to live under, um, had lived these hidden lives, um, but were in very powerful positions often. Uh, and then in 2009, I attended a ceremony at the Office of Personnel Management, um, which used to be the Civil Service Commission. That was the bureaucracy that was basically in charge of, you know, all the federal civil service. And it was, um, it was an interesting ceremony. It was an inter interesting event. It was a, uh, they were issuing a formal apology to a man named Frank Kameny, who had been fired from his job in 1957. He worked for the army map service and he was gay and he was fired because of it. And he was the first person to challenge his firing. Um, really the first person to really come out so to speak, and say, this is wrong. Uh, and he sued the government, he didn't win, but he led a very long life of, of activism. And in 2009, um, the Obama administration, uh, they issued a formal apology to Frank. Um, Michelle Obama was there, it was a very moving ceremony. And sitting there in the auditorium, I realized that you know, there were so many other people whose stories we don't know about, you know, who were fired or maybe they stayed in government, you know, they stayed in the closet and they kept their secret a secret. And I, and I realized that this was the worst possible secret that you could have. It was a very, very dangerous secret to be gay um, in Washington in particular. And it just seemed like this was a book waiting to be written, you know, to, to take all these stories and study this fear of homosexuality and how did that fear impact, 
not only people's lives on an individual basis, but our but our country as a as a whole. Um, and talking about when we tend to think about um, anti-gay uh, what uh, purges and and criticisms and such, it's often today in, in very party specific terms. Yeah. But um, when you're talking about a lot of what's happening, you spend a lot of time in the 1930s and leading up into the 1940s. Um, it was not necessarily that way. And, and of course, the, no. the political parties were very different at the time. Talk a bit about how it was at that time and then how it developed into something where it started being more uh, two-sided or whatever. Yeah. So you have to understand that the status of the homosexual, and I'm going to use that word. I know, I know that word is not, we don't, we don't use that word that much for obvious reasons. It has a sort of clinical connotation to it, but this was the word that was used at the time. So I'm, I'm going to use it. The, the status of the homosexual in 1930s America was a very precarious one. Uh, he or she, um, their existence was illegal. It was illegal to be gay in all 50 states. Um, gay people were medically pathologized. The American Psychiatric Association would not lift its um, de definition. It would not remove homosexuality from its list of mental disorders until 1973. And gay people were condemned from the pulpit of every major religion. And the social animus directed towards gay people was really unimaginable today. Um, so that's just an important context to keep in mind because um, we think today of you know, gay rights as being a kind of progressive or liberal issue. And it was not an issue at all in the 1930s. Everyone was agreed that gay people were you know, sick, they were criminals. Um, and it was a subject that was not really spoken of at all. And so what that means is that, you know, homophobia could be a weapon that anyone would use. And in fact, I write about the first outing in American political history occurred in 1942. And it was um, of a senator from Massachusetts. He was a conservative Democrat. Those used to exist, by the way, just like liberal re Republicans used to exist. You said the parties were more ideologically diverse. They certainly were. And David Walsh was a conservative isolationist Democrat from Massachusetts. And so he was quite critical of his own party's president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And in 1942, the New York Post, which also might be hard to imagine at the time, the New York Post was a liberal newspaper in the 1940s. It would be a liberal newspaper up until 1978, I believe, when Rupert Murdoch purchased it. Then it would change. Yeah. Um, but it was a liberal newspaper. It was the newspaper of the liberal intelligentsia. It was pro-FDR. It was pro-New Deal. It was pro-interventionist in World War II. They published a story um, alleging that a unnamed Senator X was all that they would refer to him at first, um, had been spotted at a male brothel that was being frequented by Nazi spies. And this is in March, uh, sorry, April, May, 1942. So just a couple months into World War II. Yeah. Um, and quietly FDR was sort of, was, was encouraging this campaign to out Walsh because they wanted to embarrass him. Um, and so this is just an early example of how, you know, people who at the time were, were progressive, they were on the liberal side of the political spectrum, um, would be willing to um, use homophobia or, or allegations of homosexuality to destroy um, a political opponent. And it would be like that really until the 70s. It's not really until um, homosexuality, until the gay liberation movement really emerges in large part in San Francisco. Um, not really till then do you see homosexuality becoming a more kind of left-right or fitting into that more left-right dynamic. And that outing of Senator of Walsh was, as you mentioned, a Democrat being outed by a liberal newspaper in defense of or in kind of support of yeah. a, a very liberal uh, presidency. Um, talk a bit about uh, FDR and his wife um, and their attitudes toward gays in their circles. Yeah. So FDR, when he was assistant secretary of the Navy, was actually caught up in a, in a gay scandal on a, on a Navy base. Um, where there were sailors allegedly involved with local men um, and under FDR's direction. I, I, they, I have to interrupt you. That's a running theme through this book of sailors being involved. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes, that is. Um, 
and he was involved in sort of a plan in which sailors were used as sexual decoys to entrap some of these men. And it became quite a big scandal for him when, when he was assistant secretary of the Navy. And in fact, at the time, just to give you an idea of the way in which homosexuality was discussed or really rather wasn't discussed, the New York Times in describing this scandal actually in the subhead of the article, it says, it says in all capital letters, details are unprintable. That was how terrible, how, how taboo the subject was, that they couldn't even refer to it. And in fact, even in the David Walsh scandal, um, I went through all the archives of the New York Post. The word homosexual never appears. They're, they're writing about it in various ways. They're writing around it. You don't need to be a, a semiotic you know, expert to understand what they're talking about, but still they wouldn't use the word homosexual. Um, that said, while FDR was involved in this plot to basically, you know, ruin David Walsh, he was trying to protect one of his closest aides from similar charges, uh, a man named Sumner Wells, who was the undersecretary of state. He was a close family friend of FDR and Eleanor. He had served as a young boy, he had served in the wedding party. Um, and he, in 1940, had propositioned a number of porters on the presidential train and this got into the hands of uh, some of his enemies in the State Department, namely the Secretary of State Cordell Hull, um, who despised Wells because FDR would often go around Hull and basically treated Hull as a figurehead, didn't even want him to be Secretary of State. He, he had to have him in that job because he was a Southern Democrat. He was a, sen a former senator from Tennessee, and he needed a Southerner in his cabinet to, to maintain the support of the Southern Democrats and his coalition. Um, so the news of Wells' indiscretions got into the hands of Hull and, and another uh, former diplomat named William Bullitt, who was the first ambassador to the Soviet Union. And they spent years trying to get FDR to fire uh, Wells. And FDR um, defended him for a long time. In fact, when Bullitt first brought the allegations to him, uh, FDR's initial response was, well, he wasn't doing it on company time, was he? So he had this kind of aristocratic attitude where I think he was sort of willing to overlook it in his friends, perhaps, but at the same time, didn't have a problem with it, using gay, gay smears, if you will, against an enemy. And of course, there's Eleanor, and you know she had a very close, tender relationship with uh, an associated press journalist named Lorena Hickok. Um, and again, I have to be very scrupulous as a journalist here. You know, we have no evidence that this was necessarily a, a consummated lesbian sexual relationship. It's all based upon their letters to each other, um, which were extremely emotional is one word to use. Um, and it may very well be the case. It was certainly, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that Eleanor um, was involved romantically with, with Lorena Hickok. Um, but she was actually, but she was quite sympathetic to Wells and also wanted to uh, de defend him and, and pressured her husband into keeping Wells on, but eventually by 1943, so you know, three years after um, the allegations of what Wells was doing on the train were, were brought to his, the, the attention of his enemies, um, there were some senators on Capitol Hill uh, who were threatening to launch an investigation. And by that point, FDR felt he had no choice and had to ask for Wells's resignation, which he did and, and he got in the fall of 1943. There's a there are I guess a number of uh, through through lines or through stories that run through the book. One of them, of course, is the 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 naval aspect. Another is um, presidents basically betraying yeah. their close friends who and trust. You know, I mean, some of their most loyal uh, advisors and staffers. Another one is and and this kind of gets to what you were just talking about about being very scrupulous as a journalist. J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Um, you know, keeper of secrets, uh, threatener of powerful people. Um, you're more circumspect about, you know, rumors about his private life. So yeah. what can you tell us about that? Well, certainly there was speculation of him being gay. And we find, you know, very from his very early days as the leader of the Bureau Invest of Investigation, which is what the FBI was called in its early years. Um, there are press reports that are noting a mince in his step. Uh, they're noting that he lives with his mother. Uh, he collects antiques, which is sort of at the time was associated as being a kind of gay male hobby. Um, Drew Pearson, who 
is also a recurring character in the book, was one of these one of the great sort of muckraking newspaper columnists of the day, um, was convinced that Hoover was a queer, as he would note. Um, I went through his extensive notes and there are all these sorts of little notes that he would keep about suspicious behavior by Hoover indicating that perhaps there was something secret going on. Um, but this has been a subject that's been poured over by many historians, um, biographers of Hoover. Uh, there's no evidence indicating that J. Edgar Hoover was gay, much less that he was a cross-dresser, which is one of the more pervasive urban myths about him. He absolutely had a doting relationship with his number two at the FBI, Clyde Tolson. Um, they traveled together on vacation. They would eat every day together at the Mayflower Hotel. I mean, I publish a photograph of them um, you know, looking like they might have been a couple. Uh, but again, there's no evidence that they were. Um, certainly, Hoover was extremely sensitive to these allegations, and the FBI was as well. Uh, and there are numerous stories, and I just I report a few of them, of private citizens who, having conversations with friends, or as I recount one story, a, a bridge party among some elderly women in, in Ohio, where one of the women says, you know, apropos of nothing, that she heard the director of the FBI is a queer. And this is in 1943. And it just so happens that one of the other women in that bridge party, her nephew is an agent in the FBI. She mentions it to him. He mentions it to his boss. It gets kicked up, you know, to the, to the top floor, all the way back to Washington. Uh, and this woman gets called into the FBI field office. And she's given a very stern talking to by the special agent in charge who demands to know where she heard this rumor, um, wants to know why she would say such a thing about the director in the middle of a war. It's his job to be protecting the nation and how dare you spread these calumnies about him. And he orders her to go back to the bridge party next week and to tell all of her um, friends that she didn't know what came over her and it was a complete lie and she takes it all back. Uh, and there are numerous you know, records of this in, in the FBI files of FBI agents, you know, tracking down rumors, trying to find out where they started and basically intimidating private citizens into keeping shut about the director and his private life. Amazing at a time when this country was fighting fascism. <laughs> I mean, it really is yeah. the, 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 your, what you relate in the book is it just was reminding me of all these stories we've read about people in Germany, people in uh, Soviet Russia. Um, people in Maoist China later. Um, so the FBI, very, very anti-gay. Yeah. Interesting where, you're, where you write about the OSS, which is mm -hmm. the forerunner of the CIA. Um, tell us about that, how they were actually more accepting of gay people and eccentricities among uh, people they brought in. Yeah, the OSS was led by a man named um, Wild Bill Donovan. And he had the attitude that we're fighting a war, we need everyone we can get. And so there were lots of leftists, right? There were lots of even maybe people who had communist sympathies. Um, he said that the best, the ideal OSS agent was someone with a PhD who could win in a bar fight. Um, and so there were lots of academics, um, lots of you know people with kind of shady backgrounds and shady histories, because that's sort of what you needed in a spy. You know, You needed someone who could go, who could lie. I mean, that's what a spy has to do. They have to pretend to be somebody else. And in this particular era, when all gay people had to lie about who they were, this was not a time when gay people could be open. Um, this naturally suited some gay people. And I highlight a number of them who did serve in the OSS. Um, there's one man in particular named Donald Downs, who was a Yale graduate, who was one of the earliest recruits. Um, and in the summer of 1942, he was tasked with infiltrating some of the neutral embassies, the embassies of neutral countries in Washington, D.C., Vichy, France, Franco is Spain. Um, and one of the tactics he did was he, he basically recruited a number of very handsome young men to basically serve as uh, Lotharios to go seduce the secretaries um, working in these places uh, so that they could then get access and, and break in and get the cipher codes uh, to translate the secret messages that were being translated back. And this is actually one of the, um, you could actually point to this being one of the earliest sorts of spats between what would become the CIA and the FBI, uh, the kind of turf battles that would rage between them for decades. 
Um, it had a lot to do with the sort of institutional cultures, the different institutional cultures between the, the two institutions. And the CIA having emerged from the OSS was more aristocratic. Uh, it was more waspy. Um, you could say they had somewhat of a higher tolerance for unorthodox personalities, including homosexuals. Uh, whereas the FBI was very blue collar, uh, very Catholic, um, very, you know, white ethnic is the term that we would have used. So lots of central people of Central and Eastern European backgrounds. Uh, and there's a great quote from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the great senator who was referring to uh, in the age of the security clearance, it was the Harvard men who were checked and the Fordham men who did the checking. And that kind of really gives you a sort of idea of what it was like in you know early cold war washington the the different institutional cultures between these um between these two places well as the cold war wore on um of course the the national security fears around homosexuals uh got worse or stronger or whatever um and you tell the story about robert cutler and a yeah. top advisor to President Eisenhower. Longtime audiences of the Commonwealth Club will remember we had Peter Schinkel here who had written a book about him. He was called Ike's Mystery Man. Um, but he ended up uh, basically being the, I guess, the kind of the, the founder of what became the National Security Council. Top level advisor, not only a gay man, but actually helped push through um, purges of, of gays and lesbians in the federal government. He was, yeah, he was basically the bureaucrat who was responsible for the executive order, 10450, uh, one of the first that Eisenhower signed in April 1953, which um, led to the purge of thousands of gay men and women. It would have happened anyway. I mean, the, the country was, um, ever since, you know, Joe McCarthy started making these accusations about communists and queers in the State Department, um, in 1950, uh, the country was was headed towards this. I think any president in 1953 would have signed a similar law. So I don't want to put too much blame on him. But yes, he was the man. He was the national security advisor, the first national security advisor that we had. Um, and he was the and he was responsible for sort of inserting that language into that executive order that uh, included sexual perversion as one of the disqualifying factors for government service and for denying security clearances um, to gay people. And it's a, you know, it's, it's like, like J. Edgar Hoover, whether or not he was gay, we don't know, but we'll see this a lot in this book are gay people in positions of power um, being put in these very uncomfortable positions where they are by choice or by, um, by whether by sin of omission or sin of commission, they are involved in, um, oppressing gay people like themselves. You, you mentioned that probably any president in that situation would have done something like that. Do you think we would have gotten to that point anyway without Joseph McCarthy? It's a good question. Um, that's a very good question. I think the country was primed for a demagogue in the late 1940s. Uh, and it's important to understand the context of what's going on. You know, America is sort of thrust onto this global stage as a global superpower. It hadn't been prepared for that. It didn't want it with World War II. And then after World War II, we're now in this competition with the Soviet Union. And in the late 1940s, things are not going our way. Um, there are a number of high profile um, spy cases, um, the most prominent one being that of Alger Hiss that I write about. And there's a whole homoerotic subtext to that. And that his chief accuser, his, his accuser, Whitaker Chambers, um, had a gay past. And there were a lot of rumors and whispers in Washington that um, perhaps Chambers and Hiss had been gay. Perhaps Chambers had wanted Hiss and Hiss had rejected him. And that was why Chambers was making these accusations. So this very prominent um, spy drama, which was the first televised congressional hearing in America was the, was the uh, House on American Activities Committee hearing in which Whitaker Chambers made these allegations. That has a whole homoerotic subtext to it. And then in February 1950, um, Joe McCarthy makes his famous speech to the Republican ladies of Wheeling, West Virginia, where he waves that list in his hand and says that he has the names of 205 communists in the State Department. Of course, he didn't, and that number fluctuated on various days. 
But less than three weeks later, Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, is called to testify um, to the Senate on these allegations, and he brings with him a deputy. Uh, and in passing, it was not prepared. I mean, just in passing, this deputy mentioned that 91 homosexuals had been separated from the State Department in the previous three years. And this is when the threat of communism becomes conflated with the threat, so to speak, of homosexuality. And in the weeks and months following these disclosures, um, uh, McCarthy is getting tens of thousands of letters to his office. And there's a newspaper report that only 25% of those letters are primarily concerned with communists in the State Department, that the rest are concerned with sexual deviants or sexual perverts in the State Department. And you know, McCarthy was a very good reader of the public mood. Um, and he was very keen to exploit these allegations. And he does. And um, the association of the State Department and homosexuality becomes very notorious, becomes a punchline of jokes. Um, and again, just to kind of give you an, an impression of how you know, liberal minded people thought about this issue, there's a, there was a cartoon published in The New Yorker around this time in 1950 where it shows a man applying for a job and he's basically pleading with the, um, the recruiter. And he says, yes, sir, it's true that I was let go from the State Department, but only for incompetence, right? So that was, that, that, you know, they didn't even need to explain the joke. It was clear what, 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 what the, uh, who the punchline was. It was gay people. Yeah. Um, and the Republicans really make an issue out of this when they're running for office in 1952. They're running on a pledge to clean up Washington which is a reference not only to the corruption in the Truman administration at the time, but also to the to the moral problems. That was the term that was used a lot, the moral problems. Uh, the phrase, you know, the lavender lads at the State Department, that, that, that becomes a line. J. Edgar Hoover is spreading rumors that Adlai Stevenson, the Democratic nominee, is a homosexual. He has three strikes against him, Adlai Stevenson. He's a bachelor. Uh, he's a former diplomat, and he's an intellectual. And all of these traits are associated uh, with, with homosexuality. Um, and so, they had, so leading into this election in 1952, it's really the first election you could say in which homosexuality becomes um, a national campaign issue. Well, obviously I want to get to uh, governor and then eventually President Reagan, but uh, take us through then, if you will, the 1960s. We've got two Democratic presidents who take up most of that time. Um, what did they do different than Eisenhower and Truman and, and FDR? And what were, in what ways was it continuation of, you know, business as usual with regards to, you know, shaming and outing yeah. and, and pushing out homosexuals? Well, with, J, with JFK, I think we get the first president who's really just comfortable around gay people. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that his best friend, Lem Billings uh, from Choate, was his, was his best friend and was gay and came out to him in high school. And uh, I think unlike many men who would have probably, not probably would have terminated the friendship immediately, uh, he remained lifelong friends with Lem Billings. And in fact, gave Lem Billings a room in the White House when, when he was president. Uh, and JFK would accumulate other gay friends. Uh, Gore Vidal, the writer who was related by marriage to his wife, Jackie. Uh, William Walton, the arts advisor in the White House, a very important role in that White House, uh, who was also a friend with Jackie. Uh, Joe Alsup, who was very closeted, uh, a very famous newspaper columnist. Um, but it was known to Kennedy that he was gay. Alsup had actually been ensnared in a, in a honey trap operation when he was in visiting Moscow. The KGB set him up with a young man and took photos of him and actually tried to blackmail him into working for them. And also quite courageously uh, refused to do that and basically wrote out an entire confession to the CIA. He did exactly what the national security state demanded of gay people at that time. Uh, the fear was that gay people would be susceptible to blackmail and that they would do anything, including give up national security secrets or betray their country. Uh, to keep their secret a secret. And Alsop actually did exactly what he what, what, a, what a patriotic citizen would have done. He told the KGB to stuff it and confess the entire incident. It had no effect on government policy, but it's an important moment that I write about in the book. Um, and it's important to note that while you know JFK had these 
deep personal friendships. And I should also add, I think JFK was perhaps more accepting of gay men and more willing to perhaps um, uh, not, not accept the prejudices of most men of his time. Because JFK also had a very sexually unorthodox life, as we know. He had a lot of sexual secrets himself. And I think that that probably had something to do with his being perhaps more sympathetic or at least maybe understanding of other men who had sexual secrets to keep. Um, but it's also important to note that the policies of the Kennedy administration when it came to gay people were unchanged. You still had purges of gay people from the State Department, from all, all government agencies. Um, LBJ uh, was very different in this regard. He was... Uh, quite perplexed, I would say, by the prospect of homosexuality, even though some of his closest advisors were gay, um, two of whom I write about. One is quite well known to historians of American politics, a man named Walter Jenkins, who was the closest aide to, at, at LBJ had. He had worked with LBJ since the 1930s when he was a congressman. And three weeks before the 1964 election, uh, Jenkins was arrested in a bathroom sting having sex in the YMCA bathroom uh, around the corner from the White House. Um, and this story becomes public and it becomes front page news. Uh, and it's a very major story. Um, in fact, I would talk to people when I was working on this book, people of a certain generation, baby boomers mostly. And they, were, they would tell me that, you know, they, were, they remembered being young and seeing this story or hearing about it, hearing about the president's aide arrested on a morals charge, that was the term that was used. And they would ask their parents, you know, what is this all about? What is a morals charge? And this was really the first time that a lot of Americans, young Americans, I think, learned about homosexuality. This is when their parents had to explain to them what this phenomenon was. And you can imagine how that would shape people's attitudes, right? This is not, you're, you're, you're not learning about gay life because you're, you know, a very nice couple, a gay couple next door or you're seeing a gay character on a television show who's portrayed in a sympathetic, humane manner. You're learning about someone who's arrested for having anonymous sex in a, in a basement bathroom of the YMCA, and he's brought into prison. Uh, and it's called a morals violation. And so that's how a lot of people learned about homosexuality in our country. And that shaped opinions um, and attitudes. The other man I write about whose story has never been told before. It's told for the first time in my book is a man named Bob Waldron, who was from Texas, who worked for LBJ um, when he was Senate Majority Leader and then as Vice President. He traveled the world with him. Uh, he was basically LBJ's body man, which is a very Washington job. It's basically a gopher. Um, it's the guy who follows him around, makes sure he's showing up for appointments on time. Waldron was also an excellent stenographer, um, was the fastest stenographer on LBJ's staff, was very close to him. And then in the weeks after the Kennedy assassination, um, LBJ was trying to get him on Waldron onto his White House staff, and he had to undergo a background check for this. And in the course of that background check, the Civil Service Commission discovered that Waldron was gay. And in an instant, his life was you know, thrown into disarray. He was fired. He was cut off, banned from the White House. Um, and it's a very sad, tragic story that I, that I relate in the, in the book. Perhaps the president who sticks out most to me as an interesting case here of handling and mishandling the gay issue is Ronald Reagan. Mm. And maybe it's because my age, I was a teenager in the 1980s, so kind of watching all of what was going on and trying to, you know, read between the lines as we do. Um, your writing about him taught me a number of things I'd never heard, including that his wife, Nancy, had dated a gay man and had been uh, engaged to one before marrying Ronald. But talk, if you will, about Ronald Reagan and his attitude and his actions toward homosexuals throughout his career, because yeah. it has a long. Uh, yeah, I would start with his being a young Hollywood actor. And um, he was filming a movie with Betty Davis called Dark Victory, and it was directed by a bisexual British director named Edmund Goulding. And this is back during the days of the code, uh, the production code, uh, in which many things were not allowed to be depicted on film. One of them was homosexuality or sexual perversion, as it was referred to at the time. But Goulding wanted uh, Reagan in this film. He was starring opposite Betty Davis. And he wanted Reagan to basically play the role of the gay best friend. Um, 
but he had to obviously couch it and it had to be disguised. And Reagan was relating this in a, in a memoir that was published when he was running for governor in 1965. And the way he described it, he said that Goulding wanted me to portray this character as if he was the sort of fella who could sit in the girls' dressing room and dish the dirt with them while they got dressed, which is a very sort of long, euphemistic way of saying he wanted me to play a gay guy. Um, and Reagan was very uncomfortable with this. He was quite put off by it and didn't want to do it. Um, so even the idea of playing a gay role was upsetting to him. And we know that there was a lot of fear among him and his wife and his advisors that being in this Hollywood milieu, um, and they had many gay friends. We just mentioned, you know, Nancy. Um, they were very close friends with Billy Haynes, who was the first silent movie star who gave up a career, by the way, because he was basically forced by the studio production head. I can't remember if it was which one it was, but basically said to him, you have to give up your boyfriend or give up your career in Hollywood. Um, and he chose to stay with his partner. And he went on to become one of the leading interior decorators of Los Angeles, including to the Reagans, to Nancy Reagan. Um, and when Reagan was governor uh, in 1967, Drew Pearson, again, this recurring figure, he publishes a column in his syndicated column in which he alleges that there is a uh, there was a kind of gay network working in Reagan's office, his gubernatorial office, and that several of these men participated in a gay orgy at a rental house in um, Lake Tahoe. One of the men being a uh, uh, future congressman. Well, he doesn't name uh, right. Pearson, right. Pearson didn't name any names, but he did refer to a athletic advisor who is no longer in the office because of the fall athletic season. And it didn't take an expert to figure out who he was talking about because the previous summer, uh, Jack Kemp, who at the time was the starting quarterback for the Buffalo Bills and a sort of budding policy wonk, he had spent the summer interning for Reagan. Um, and he had um, co-owned this timeshare with one of the men that was that Reagan would later fire as part of this scandal. And so this kind of, like the, the, the stench of this scandal would stay with Kemp for decades. And in fact, in 1980, according to Lynn Nofziger, who was the communications director for Reagan, in 1980, it, it was apparently sufficient to um, destroy his chances of being Reagan's vice president. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this is a big scandal in 1967. Reagan does fire these aides. It's brought to his attention by it. And it's unclear, by the way, if this orgy ever happened. Uh, it, 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 it was, as we'll see often in this book, homosexuality or accusations of it are used as a political weapon in sort of these inter-office um, disputes. And there were some advisors who didn't like another group of advisors in Reagan's office. And they, there were suspicions that these, that these other advisors were gay. And so they just used that. And they, come up, they came up with a dossier. They put a dossier together. They had hired a private investigator to investigate these men. They brought it to Reagan. Reagan did fire them. Um, and then the news of this gets out when Drew Pearson writes his, his column. And at first, Reagan denies that this ever happened. And his instincts were right. He had this libertarian sense of personal privacy. He didn't want these men's you know, families to be ruined. He didn't want their careers to be ruined. He just wanted to sweep it under the rug. And he angrily denies that this ever happened. Two weeks later, he's forced to admit that some men were fired. Um, he then sort of jokes about it, um, but it sticks with him and it sort of adds to this fear or the sensitivity that Reagan will be perceived as not only being too friendly to gay people, but perhaps even gay himself. This is according to Lynn Knopsiger in his memoir. He says that, you know, we were concerned that because of um, Reagan's Hollywood background, his work as an actor, that there are lots of gay people in Hollywood at the time, that we were concerned that Reagan would be seen as gay himself. And so we had to take a zero tolerance policy um, to the presence of potential homosexuals in the administration. Um, and then in 1980, uh, one of my big discoveries in this book, 
Uh, Pete McCloskey, who's a local personality, he gets word from a friend of his that over the years, several Reagan advisors had made sexual advances on this friend of his. Um, Simultaneously, uh, Bob Livingston, who's a congressman, a freshman congressman from Louisiana, he's going out for dinner with a a guy who runs a right-wing think tank. They get very drunk. He's unsure if this guy makes a pass at him. Uh, He calls Pete McCloskey terrified from the basement of the Capitol gym, the Rayburn House office building, the members gym. He's terrified that this that this man who works for a right wing think tank that deals in Latin American issues and had been advising the Reagan campaign on a sort of informal basis. He's under the impression that there's this some right wing cabal that's militantly anti-communist, potentially tied into, you know, various juntas and paramilitaries in Latin America. This kind of gets into Pete McCloskey's mind that that there is a right wing network dating back to when Reagan was governor in the 1960s. He types out this 13 page memorandum where he lays out all the intricate details of this conspiracy. He brings it to uh, Ronald to um, Ben Bradley, the uh, the legendary executive editor of The Washington Post. And tells Bradley, you need to look into this because we don't want another Tom Eagleton on our hands. Tom Eagleton being uh, George McGovern's vice presidential running mate in 1972, who just two weeks after he was nominated, um, his medical history was leaked and it was revealed that he had undergone electroshock therapy. And this was a big surprise and it and it really was a was a problem. And he had to drop off the ticket. Sergeant Shriver came on the ticket, but it was one of these sorts of things that had been kept secret that was very politically damaging. And Pete McCloskey was worried, was concerned that there could be this right wing network of homosexuals controlling Ronald Reagan as if he was the Manchurian candidate. That was the term that he wrote in this memo to Bradley. And we can kind of snigger at this today and laugh at it. But this is, you know, over 40 years ago. Um, It's not so far removed from the era of the Lavender Scare. It's not so far removed from the period when there was a real panic about gay people. Let's not forget, you know, gay people were still barred from holding security clearances in 1980. They wouldn't be allowed to receive them until 1995. So Bradley takes this quite seriously and he gets his top reporters, including Bob Woodward to investigate it. Um, And they do discover that a number of Reagan advisors are in fact gay. Probably the most senior one of them Uh, who's no longer with us, uh, is a man named Peter Hannaford, um, who with Michael Deaver, uh, who would go on to be Reagan's chief of staff, Hannaford and Deaver were basically running Ronald Reagan's, um, you know, public image in between his being governor and running for president. Reagan was publishing three columns a week. He was uh, traveling the country speaking. Uh, He had run for president in 1976, challenging Gerald Ford. Peter Hannaford was one of the top men. Uh, Deaver and Hannaford had a consulting firm. Um, Hannaford was exposed in this. He was not outed, but he was one of the names that was brought to the attention of Bradley. Um, And then McCloskey brought this allegation to Ed Meese, who at the time was the campaign chairman. And I was not able to get this down definitively, but Hannaford did not go into the Reagan administration. Um, and it's unclear whether or not it was because of this allegation that 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 he had been exposed uh, as having a gay a gay life. Um, it may have been that he had not ever intended to go in, but according to McCloskey, um, Ed Meese told him that that Hannaford would not be getting a job in the administration. Ed Meese told me that you know he Ed, Ed Meese told me that Peter Hannaford was never gay, and this conversation did not happen in the way Pete McCloskey recounted it. So it's a kind of he said she said story. Like, as you can imagine, this this issue for some people of a certain generation is still very, very sensitive. Um, but that that I think is important to know this story and it's important to know it, to understand the fear that homosexuality could inspire in people um, at, at the time, particularly when it revolved around issues of politics and national security. There's such a um, an evolution in, in 
attitudes toward homosexuality over the generations. And I mean, talking about, you know, in 1980, there, you know, there was still these, these rules and such. But of course, the people who were still in charge of government, who were still the, the core of the voting public, who were still the media people, were people who had been there for decades. And, and uh, you know, they were reflecting older, older views. Um, and at, it, it, it's just interesting that, you know, so many of the people who went through things and then when they were pushed out of government, just went away quietly. Yeah. And, and it, it, so it, 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 that, that whole, uh, I'll use the term oppression, that, 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 that sense of oppression, that, that systematic uh, attempt to silence them, not only worked to get them out of active government roles, but, you know, it, it went with them for the rest of their life. And, and you know, you think even uh, through uh, former New York Mayor Ed Koch. Um, Absolutely. You know, There's actually, a, you know, I, we talked earlier about this man, Bob Waldron, who worked for LBJ. Uh, and I actually discovered the reason I'm able to tell his stories because I got his FBI file, his thousand page FBI file, completely unredacted. And in that file, I found is included um, a letter that he wrote to the man who had outed him to the Civil Service Commission. And there's just in a way he describes what it was like to be identified as a gay person in this era. Um, and he says, I will be marked by our society, which does not permit a return. And that, you know, if you were a gay person in who had aspirations of working in public service and you were marked as gay, there was no return for you. And Bob Waldron, you know, he went off and he had a very successful career as an interior decorator. Uh, you're seeing that sort of a, a recurring theme in this interior decoration. Um, <laughs> but he, you know, he wanted a career in public service. And he had, that's, what, that's what he had committed his life to. And he was very close to working in the White House, right? He was very close to reaching that pinnacle that every, every person who works in politics, whether they tell you or not, they all want to work in the White House. That's what they're all, that's what they all want. Yeah. And that opportunity was denied to him because he was gay. And yes, he went off and he had a successful career in another field. Um, but the one that he had dreamed of, you know, was, was de denied to him. And there were so many men and women for whom that opportunity was um, really unjustly denied them. When you, you give even, a, a, I guess, a preamble in the book to kind of pre-Cold War times and, and going back to Lincoln and, and von Steuben and others, um, when the idea of gayness or homosexuality as a part of one's identity or right. even the core of an identity didn't exist. So I could see, you know, and however long that kind of lasted through various people in, in society that to be in a position where, well, if this is a part of me that I, have, that I have to hide, okay, that's a part of me I have to hide. It's not me. Whereas in, you know, through the modern lens, we'd look at right. and say, no, that, that is your core you. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't really see sort of gay political scandals really emerging until around World War II. Um, probably for this reason that you know, the notion of a gay identity doesn't really, it's not really under, it's not really written about until the late 19th century. Homosexuality as a concept. That's not to say that there weren't people who perhaps understood themselves as same sex attracted, right? Obviously, gay people have existed forever, but the language for describing it was not one that we really had um, codified until the late 19th century. But these, it doesn't really become a all pervasive fear until World War II, because that's when homosexuality goes from being a sin, a medical condition to a national security threat. Because prior to that, the United States didn't have an intelligence service, you know? And in fact, there's one just, just to give you an idea of what secrets were like in Washington, there's a story I tell. Um, I came across it in the diary of FDR's naval aide, John McRae. And he's walking down the street past the Corcoran Gallery, which if anyone knows Washington, D.C., is just across the street from the White House. And across the street from the building that is now the old executive office building, the Eisenhower building, it used to be the, off the Department of War, State, and the Navy. They were all in the same building. And he's walking down the street and he sees this white paper just fluttering in the air and he snatches it up and he looks at it and it says top secret on it. 
And it had just flown out the window of the State Department's, right? And so this is how secrets were thought of. It was not this, you know, the notion of a security clearance, you know, the notion of like entering a building and having five different people check your ID, and then you go into a certain, you know, um, se secure compartment to read classified information. We are far away, you know, that, that changed with World War II. That's, that's when the notion of national security even became a notion. Uh, I don't even think that term existed until until World War II, and that's when homosexuality becomes securitized, um, and, it, and it becomes um, it's elevated from just um, a sin into being a national security threat. It reminds me of a book by uh, the historian Karen Abbott about the Civil War. And these are women who she tells stories of multiple women on each side who, who basically spied or whatever, um, and, you know, helped the other side uh, through the war. And it's it's a gobsmacking story because so many of the things you're just like, wait a minute, she got her slave who was almost emancipated to work in President Jefferson's uh, house and it was that easy. And this other person yeah. goes in and meets with the, uh, you know, Lincoln's secretary of war or whatever, and just walks into his office and yeah, different times, different times. Yes. Um, well, we're, we're running a bit short on time. So I want to try to get a number of things. One person asks, uh, by the way, one of our viewers asks, going back to your first anecdote, was there indeed a male brothel in Washington, D.C. at the time? Well, this, I, I believe this is the story about David Walsh. I, maybe I didn't mention it. The male brothel was uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and there was a male brothel. Uh, it's unclear, brothel might not be the right term for it. It was a townhouse where rooms were available for the hour. You would pay the proprietor. Uh, there were young men uh, available. And whatever monetary exchange went on, in the privacy of those rooms was between, you know, you and the young gentleman. So the owner of the proprietor of the house would do this to basically try to, you know, create a legal gray area, right, where he might be able to avoid prosecution. It was, you could call it a house of ill repute, perhaps, or I believe they called it a house of degradation might be yeah. the, the legal term. And it did exist. It was in, it was in Brooklyn. The notion that there, there were the allegation that there were Nazi spies frequenting it, there was no evidence for that. Um, there, there's so much in this book. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it, it's a, a long book. It's tons of great research in it. Was it difficult to do any of the research? Was it difficult to get people to talk about things? Even talking about some people who maybe were very reticent yeah. in their lives about this. Absolutely. Um, it took years of, of work um, doing all sorts of archival research in presidential libraries, personal paper collections, um, getting government documents declassified from various government agencies, the FBI um, in particular, uh, lots of interviews. There were people who were hesitant to talk. Um, the aforementioned Bob Livingston was not very happy to talk about this and our interview did not last very long. Um, but uh, I found enough material uh, to put together um, a pretty a pretty long book. There was also a lot of, you know, reading between the lines, as you said earlier, because a lot of this, a lot of the written record was not um, explicit. Um, a lot of gay people, you know, they might have kept diaries, but they did not want to save all these details for posterity. Or in many cases, when you're dealing with gay people who've left um, papers behind their families, will destroy the material, right? Because they come across it and they're ashamed of it and they don't want anyone to know. Um, so yes, when you're doing gay history, you have to be uh, creative in finding things and also um, interpreting material because a lot of it is, is written in code. That's why the OSS went after gay uh, employees. <laughs> um, you're a gay man. If you weren't in journalism, this is going to be a, an off the wall question, but if you weren't in journalism, but had instead pursued a role in official Washington, which pre-Clinton presidency do you think would have been most, would have been easiest for you to work in? Uh, well, as a, as a gay person, it probably would have been the Carter administration. 
that's when, so 1975 is the year that the Civil Service Commission lifted the ban on gay people working in the civil service. And so you started to see gay people coming in mm -hmm. to federal government jobs and they start working in the Carter administration, not in the White House, at least not openly. I do tell the story of a woman, Midge Costanza, who was a closeted lesbian. She was the director of public engagement. She organized the first meeting of gay activists at the White House in 1977, a move that led to her basically being or resigning because it was quite unpopular with some of the other people in the Carter administration. They thought she was pushing the envelope a little too much. Um, but you do see gay people starting to work in, you know, the federal government in the late 1970s. And then, you know, ironically or not, the Reagan administration would be the gayest of all. Um, lots of gay people, particularly gay men, coming to work in the Reagan administration. Um, oh my, you know, kind of tragic, a tragic paradox given yeah. you know the AIDS the AIDS crisis that would later take place. And what role you, you you do write a lot about this? But what role do you think AIDS played in either? Well, it, it what impact did it have on the way gay men were yeah were perceived and whatever freedoms they did or did not have within official Washington? Well, it forces a lot of people out of the closet because you can't hide the fact that you're dying of a disease. Yeah. And, you know, I write about one man in particular who was very powerful, influential, conservative force in 1980s Reagan, Washington, named Terry Dolan, who was the co-founder of an organization called NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. It's one of the first PACs. And he really pioneers the 15 and 30 second attack ad. Um, and what they do is they're, you know, they're raising money independent of the political parties and campaigns and spending it. Uh, this, so the whole, you know, independent expenditure organization, Terry Dolan really pioneers that. And he plays a crucial role in helping to get Reagan elected in taking back the Senate for the Republicans in 1980. He's also a gay man. And he's outed in 1982 um, in a book about the religious right because he, he formed alliances with Jerry Falwell and the, and the New Rights. He was basically a leading figure of the New Right. And interestingly, the mainstream media does not pick this up. They don't write about it. Um, it's against their sense of propriety. Um, the, you know, the, the, the defense that is made for outing, and this is, the, this is a new term now. Out, it, was, it was initially called outage was the term. I learned that while reading this book. Outing wouldn't be coined until I think 1990 in Time Magazine. Um, but the rationale for outing Dolan is, well, he's a hypocrite. You know, where we now actually have out gay people. We have out gay activists. We have gay people working in government now. You can do that. Um, and Terry Dolan is, you know, he's allied with Jerry Falwell, but he's leading a secret gay life. The mainstream press doesn't touch this until after he dies of AIDS. Terry Dolan dies of AIDS in 1986. And then Ben Bradley again is um, confronted with this dilemma where here is this very high profile, powerful, influential conservative figure who's involved in a political movement that is, you know, not doing enough to fight AIDS or is openly homophobic, you could say, certainly many elements of the religious right. Um, he dies of this disease. He's a public figure who's died of a disease. This is a newsworthy story. Uh, and so the Washington Post starts preparing a, an expose on the, on the secret gay life and death of Terry Dolan. It also happens that Terry Dolan's brother, Tony Dolan, is Ronald Reagan's chief speechwriter. And the Post is trying to get Tony Dolan to cooperate with this story, to talk. He is adamant that this is a violation of his brother's privacy. And um, I recount the behind the scenes battle that goes on between the most powerful journalist in Washington, Ben Bradley, and the chief speechwriter to the president of the United States. They're both going back and forth over the journalistic propriety of publishing, um, of publishing this, this story. It, it, today, we, we look at so much of the journalistic landscape as, as a disaster, frankly. Um, at least, especially people with kind of a more traditional view of what the media is and such. Um, and certainly in the area of uh, reporting on the private lives of 
uh, public officials, whether it's scandalous or just intimate. Um, what do you make of over the course of the time covered in this book from, you know, Drew Pearson to Ben Bradley making different sorts of decisions? Um, was the media pushing the country in one direction, one thought, one way of, of kind of approaching this issue? Or were they just reflecting what they thought the readers wanted and, and they were a reflection of uh, kind of attitudes toward homosexuality at large? It's interesting. Um, the media is often playing a very irresponsible role in my book. Um, they are sensationalist. Uh, they are not serving the purpose of questioning uh, orthodoxies or his public, you know, moral hysterias. You know, during the lavender scare, I came across maybe one journalist who was really questioning the rationale for purging gay people from the government. Uh, his name was Max Lerner, um, who was a great sort of liberal journalist. And he was writing for the New York Post, actually, the same paper that outed David Walsh. Eight years later, in 1950, he does a very good series called The Washington Sex Story, where he goes down to Washington and just does a 12-part series on the fear of homosexuals in government. And he interviews doctors, he interviews people on Capitol Hill. There's a very amusing interview that I recount where he interviews the chief of the Washington, D.C. police, whose job it is is to basically entrap gay men, and who's basically was like treated as like, he was treated as the, the, the main authority on homosexuality in Washington, <laughs> was, the, was the chief of police. He, and he just interviews him, and he's because the chief of police, Roy Blick was his name, he had claimed that there were 5,000 homosexuals in Washington. And Lerner wants to know, well, how did you find this number? He says, well, you know, we arrested a thousand of them and we just figured we'd multiply it by five. And he said, well, why did you do that? And he just, he exposes just the complete yeah. lack of any kind of scientific rigor or, you know, reasoning behind these, these policies. But that was an extremely rare case. Most of the time, the journalists are just going along with the kind of prevailing orthodoxy, right? Which is that gays were a national security threat. Um, and occasionally you would see some stories, I think later in the 60s, um, after Catherine Graham becomes publisher of the Washington Post, actually, and then brings, bring, brings Ben Bradley in, they start doing more serious coverage of gay people and actually interviewing real gay people. Because of course, part of the story is, is that you know, when these hysterical stories of uh, gay people infesting the government, there were no openly gay people, you know, so everyone was in the closet. And so it was very difficult um, for gay people to tell their stories. And I think that's a huge part of this book is that when something was secret and you weren't allowed to talk about it and it was enforced, right, by our societal conventions mm -hmm. that gay people could not be open about who they were, that the word homosexuality was considered too scandalous to print. You could basically say anything about homosexuals, that they were fascists, that they were communists, that they were pedophiles, that they were infiltrating the government on behalf of foreign powers, that they were spies and traitors. And then once gay people start coming out of the closet in the 60s and 70s, then journalists start interviewing them, they start writing about them. Uh, you start seeing their you know, lives being dealt with in an honest, fair manner. That's when the prejudices start to break down. Um, uh, and the media is able to play a more responsible educational role. Well, great. On that note, uh, we're going to wrap this up. The name of the book is Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. The author has been our special guest this hour, James Kirchick. Thank you very much for joining us for this hour, James. Thanks so much. It was great. And thanks to all of you watching and listening online. Have a good rest of your week. Have a good night. <laughs>